I'm just right now positively identifying this sword fern. And it's got a little peculiarity to it. I love this when this happens. Look at that little lobe there in the bottom of the leaf. You can learn a lot about plant identification from watching these films, but you cannot learn it all. Turn to your books, and go online, but most importantly, find a local edible wild plant teacher. Learn from them firsthand so you can have 100% accuracy and you can enjoy the wild harvest safely. Such a beautiful and delicate little flower. There's so much to learn about local foraging and wild harvesting. And over the years, I think one of the greatest lessons that I've learned is that there are many species of plants that actually benefit by our harvesting of them. We help them to spread out more seeds, to shoot out more roots. See, in reality, the loving, respecting, and helping wild plants to not only survive but to thrive, that's the essence of the wild harvest. You know what, Paul? It's almost invariably the case that I come out looking for a wild edible plant and I find something better. You see this little guy? All these beautiful little white flowers all around us. This is Western Spring Beauty. This is our plant and it is just a wonderful treat. Now the thing about the Spring Beauty is this. It's in decline, it's felt in a lot of areas. And the reason for its decline is not over harvesting. It's actually for a lack of harvesting. This is one of those plants that benefits by being disturbed, by being thinned out, by having its seeds spread. So in this case, we've got all this spring beauty all around. This is a massive patch, by the way, so we're very, very lucky. But I want you to harvest these responsibly. This is gonna be your job. So there's a couple of tricks to it. Number one, if you see a rather large potato, like corm, as they call it, leave that one. It will shoot out more flowers, more flowers, more seeds. Let those large ones continue to put out lots of flowers. Go for the medium ones. And there's one other technique that I'd like to share with you as well. If you see dense clusters of them, which there are a few patches around here, go for those first and don't take them all. Harvest responsibly. Take one or two out. And what you're doing then, you're creating some room in the ground for perhaps the larger of them to grow even larger. Put out even more flowers, spreading more seeds. This is a treat. All right, I leave it to you. And oh, one more thing. As always, remember, plant, meet chef. Chef, meet plant. This plant lives here 365 days a year. You're here just today. So get to know the plant, get to know the area, and just let that inspire you. Though you've got to be careful about which variety of spring beauty you're finding, as some are endangered in certain areas, others are abundant and spread across much of North America in all kinds of habitats. Oh, wait a minute. Wow, that was close. This isn't spring beauty. It may even be a plant that's toxic. This is spring beauty. They were beside each other. The corms of each were actually touching. And I pretty much just was ready to throw this into the collection dish. Oh my gosh, I actually did do it. <laughs> I threw this little plant in the dish because I was so focused on the corm and not looking at the flower. And I threw this in, and this is not spring beauty and could be poisonous. You've gotta be careful. I'll let this guy go back here. Enjoy the rest of his life right here. Oh, 
Uh, you know, Paul, it's great that I can get you up into the hills and we can check out the wildflowers. So I'm walking along the fence line and I see this guy. I bet you know what that is. Uh, not precisely. It looks like it's from the Balm family. You know, that's pretty crazy that you're eating it without checking to make sure that it's not like a joke I'm going to play on you. Say, yeah, that's highly toxic. I'm kind of counting that you're going to direct me to something that's worthy of cooking. Yeah, no. It's catnip. So mint family. And raw, cooked, whatever you want to do with the leaves. It's the mint family, and it's a wonderful... I actually make a lot of tea out of catnip. But in the kitchen, it's all on you. Fun. Here's one for you. And right now, my mind's... I have catnip growing at the restaurant. It just kind of pops up, but I never processed that I could use the catnip. I always thought, well, if cats like it, I'll leave it for the cats. In the end, this is a wonderful treat in the kitchen. It's mint, basically. You can see all the tall dead stalks from last year, and there's tons of it here. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna leave you here just for a minute, and now that you know you've got catnip, Western Spring Beauty, I've got a treat for you for the third ingredient. Okay. You want to wait for me here? Yeah. I'll be right back. Should I be nervous? Not at all. You should be excited. <laughs> so he says. Originally from Southern Europe, the Middle East, Central Asia, and China, catnip is now naturalized throughout North America and New Zealand. And you can find it everywhere. So the harvest is usually abundant. All right. Well, we've got the spring beauty. We've got the catnip. Two vastly different plants, really. So for the third and final ingredient, and the one big surprise of the day, is that it was something that I had to process. So last year, when this particular plant was ripe, I thought, I have to do it. So I pulled out the ladder, I went over to the tree, I gathered all of the fruit, I went into the kitchen, I spent days processing them so that I could bring you my very own homemade, sugar-free, yet wonderfully delicious and sweet, crab apple jelly. And that's not what I was expecting at all. Well done. It's good, eh? You nailed it. That's really good. Kevin? Huh? Mm, that's floral. Uh -huh. Isn't that good? My initial thought is I've got to separate flavors because I have three very dynamic ranges of flavor. The catnip, which is minty and strong and herbaceous. It's big. It's not a mild flavor. The crab apple jelly, well, that's sweet and round and robust. It's not as in your face as the, the raw catnip, but nonetheless, both of them are a lot stronger than the spring beauty. And that's just so delicate. I've got to think my way around this and how to get the best out of each and every one of them. It's not often I have a chance to set up a kitchen right where we're harvesting a special ingredient like the spring beauty. To actually see it growing and to think about preparation, I have this feeling that with an ingredient that's so delicate, I could easily overdo it, overcomplicate it. What I really want to do is celebrate it and showcase all the little subtleties that it holds. My first course, I've got an idea, which involves the spring beauty. It will be the, the star of the show. One thing I noticed when I tried it, it had this pea-like quality to the flavor, and that's the stem and the flower. The corn was a little bit different, however. That had a, a radishy texture. In fact, I think I'm gonna try some here pretty quick. Wes is out getting me some. And I think for the salad, I actually will need a fair amount. So I hope he delivers. That's good. I think I've got what you need, Paul. How'd you make out? I think I made out really well, but you tell me. There you go. Nicely done. Gosh, they're beautiful. I'm carefully cutting the flower from the corm. I don't want to tear it. I want a nice clean cut, just like when you're doing any sort of flower arrangement. Fresh cut on the flower stem helps it drink, and I plan on soaking the stems and the blossoms in water, just so they have a chance to stay nice and crisp and fresh. Well, one thing's for certain, there's a different yield of the corm versus the flower. I'm not getting a, a huge quantity to work with, so I think what I'll do is I'll keep those maybe as a garnish. 
but the sweet spot right here is actually the sweet ingredient, the stem and blossom. So chill, so relaxed. I'm thinking I'll make a salad that I can accentuate that pea-like flavor that's in the stem and the blossom, but also use these little nuggets to garnish the plate. I think it's gonna be fun. And this little guy here. Now it's time for me to play with this crazy idea. A little sugar, a little salt. Next, it's time to get the other stuff ready for the salad. So for this, I've gotta be careful. These radishes have to be paper thin. some pre-cooked red potatoes, and they're cooked pretty soft on purpose. So I'll just marinate for a couple of minutes. Some catnip. Good. All right. So this salad is a riff on the mimosa salad. Now, a mimosa is a tribute salad, essentially celebrating flowers that are popping up through the snow, very much like this area would have been a few days ago. Awesome. You hungry? Yep, as a matter of fact, I am. Good timing, then. Oh, wow. That just looks beautiful, Paul. Remember I sent you shopping? Yeah. For a food safe yeah. spray container? OK, do tell. I haven't got a clue. It is a saline that I made, so salt, a little bit of sugar, and a little bit of spruce. OK, wonderful. Let's dig in, make sure. Mm -hmm. At some point, you get a, a nice mouthful of the flower and the stem. Mmm. Very fresh, very light. Here's my reaction to you. First of all, the flavor is delicious, so I'm not denying it's very fresh, it's very open and vibrant in my mouth. The uh, raw corms that are in there uh, actually are a wonderful crunch. It's like a radish texture, right? Yeah. They are like little mini radishes. Even though they're called little potatoes, they're, they're more like little mini radishes. However, the potatoes overtaking the spring beauty. So for me, I would have wanted there to be maybe even equal portioning of the spring beauty to the potatoes to really feel like I'm eating mostly spring beauty. For me, it's a chance to learn. And the, the thing that everyone has is a different perspective on food. So when I was making this dish, I was trying to bring a lot to the plate, perhaps too much. Still, my goal was to celebrate the spring beauty, but to give something that had some bulk to it as well, because it's so delicate. So to listen to your comments is a good thing, because I'm listening, and I hear you, and I don't disagree. Well, that's terrific. The end comment is that it's still delicious. Well, I'm excited to see what you've got for the second round. Cheers. Okay, time for a little plant morphology on this little spring beauty. And the wonderful thing about being able to identify this flower here and now is that 
Finally, I'm looking at a plant that actually is in full bloom. It has its petals showing. It's one thing to identify a plant when you cannot see the bloom. You have to go by a lot of other factors with the leaves and the stems and the roots. But when you've got the blooms, it's just more information. And it certainly is an advantage in identifying Claytonia lanceolata. So how do we determine that this definitely is Claytonia? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the leaves. These particular leaves are on either side of the stem. They're opposite and they're lanceolate which is to say lance-shaped, really. Now let's take a look at this little flower here. What are the characteristics of it? All right, I need some help. Don't say anything. <sighs> let's just say I'm, I'm like a fine vintage now, okay? All right, oh, there it is. Five petals, five stamens. So the petals, the petals of the flower, the stamens, the male sexual part, which is in the middle of the flower, usually. And that's what we're looking at, amongst other things, with this particular blue. The flowers are usually pink or white, and then they often have these little stripes that are everything from a very pale pink to almost a red color. But they're just a beautiful little flower. And they are the first flower to bloom in the spring after the snow. And you come out and you look for them, and there they are, just covering sections of the forest floor with a beautiful, pink and white display. Claytonia lanceolata, spring beauty. I'm excited about the next dish. It's a chance for me to use Les's delicious crab apple jelly. It's gonna be a beautiful base for a barbecue sauce. It's really simple. Crab apple jelly in the pot, a little cider vinegar. Now barbecue sauce is really all about the balance of sweet and sour. Mostly, it's made with tomatoes, but this is gonna be better. So right now I've got the jelly and it's melted. Now it's just reducing it down, allowing that extra moisture in there to evaporate, and also that process thickens it. Cucumbers, the foundation of a salad called Rada, which is cucumber, onions, mint, and yogurt. A little salt. What I'm doing right now is salting the cucumber and allowing some of that cucumber water to leach out. But I also want to use this as a chance to get some of that catnip flavor into it, almost like doing a quick pickle. All right, I'm just gonna let it hang over the bowl in this sieve. So all that liquid that's in there falls away from the cucumber, just leaving me the flavorful catnip cucumber slices behind. Rada also normally has onions. In this case, I, I think an onion might be too strong, so I'm using a shallot. Good stuff. Shall I? And a lot more catnip. All right, just gonna let that stand for a couple of minutes. Now oh, that's a nice piece of pork. fun moment for me. I'm flattening the pork chop. What this does is it allows me to cook it quickly. And because I have a lot of surface area, it's gonna capture more smoke from the barbecue, which is gonna work with the crab apple barbecue sauce and give a platform to stack all the other ingredients on top. I'm also leaving the fat on the sides because as it cooks, that fat will render and it will drip onto the charcoal, adding smoke, adding flavor. Paul, have you got a lighter? I do. Thanks. Usually I just rub two sticks together. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Oh, look at that, they're exploding. I think my pants hot. They're done. Okay. All right. Is it dinner time? It is. Well, there's nothing about this that doesn't look fantastic. OK, should I just dip and go for it? Sure. OK. Yeah, right. play around with the flavors. So next to the, the crab apple barbecue, you have uh, the catnip in a areta salad. And uh, that salad oh, There's a kick to that. Oh, it's... Oh, I was, I was thinking it was going to be all sweet and crab apple-y. And it is, at first. And then, and, and then, then kaboom, you get that burst of, of spice, and uh, it's right at the back of my throat, but in a, in a good way. Here's how you deal with that. Okay. Have a bite of the catnip salad. Let's see what that does to your palate after having the spice. Oh, yeah, you nailed it there. That is actually, I think, done to perfection. There's the corm. Mm. Oh, Paul. I mean, the magic of the spring beauty. And even just looking at it, it looks wonderful. I'm so grateful that you took my crab apple jelly and turned it into barbecue sauce. I never would have thought that. I thought you were just going to put it on something as a bit of a sweetener sort of thing. But to turn it into barbecue sauce, what a, what a great trick. And you're right. I love what you've got going on the combination of flavors. I actually really enjoy dishes when you can do a little journey on the plate going from one to the other to the other. That just makes the eating more fun. Yeah, it really does tell the story of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. It's my turn. Oh, I went real simple this time. Catnip tea. Nothing more, nothing less. This is a wonderful calming tea. I drink this tea, oh, probably every night if I can. Uh, and it just is a very soothing effect on the mind, and it's very calming and, and good for the stomach as well. Have a taste. Oh, that's good. Isn't that great? And how well does that fit with this, oh, once again, this meal? Once again, palate cleanser. Mm. What a great chance we've had to enjoy the spring beauty with such a, a bounty around us. It's been 35 years of gathering plants for me, and this is the first time in my life that I find myself in an area with such a wonderful abundance of spring beauty that I can enjoy the bounty. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a spiritual thing. Maybe all these plants and trees and flowers, they let us know. They avail themselves to us when they're ready, when the time is right. And today, for Paul and I, this was the right day to enjoy the spring beauty and the wild harvest. If you'd like to continue the Wild Harvest with me and Chef Paul Rogalski, then please check out our website at wildharvestfilms.com where we have recipes and foraging tips along with deleted scenes and outtakes from the making of Les Stroud's Wild Harvest. Directly inspired by the series, Chef Paul and expert forager Les Stroud bring you the Wild Harvest Season 2 recipe book. Highlighting all of Paul's dishes and complete with behind-the-scenes stories, it is available for $29.99. In addition, a DVD of this season is also available for $19.99. To order, 
please go to wildharvestfilms.com, Wild Harvest TV Show on Facebook, or Les Stroud's Wild Harvest on YouTube. Thank you.